praticamente. Eh? una performance io non so se si può Sì, funziona. Who is the chairman? Ah, I self chairman. Or what? <laughs> no, I, please stay. Stay sitting. No. Okay, thank you, Chair. <laughs> this work uh, was done in close collaboration with uh, Professor Vladimir Virzowski, that he probably is very well known to most people here. He's from the University of Kiev. Unfortunately, he was unable to come because both problems of funding and also because of the objective difficulties for traveling outside Ukraine. But uh, uh, he told me that uh, to give uh, all best greetings, to, uh, greetings from him to the organizers of this uh, nice workshop and to everybody.
we hope, we, I think, I hope in the future we, we shall have him in, in presence again soon, hopefully. Well, uh, personally, I'm not in the field since uh, so much time as Professor Wisowski, just uh, three, four years. But I was impressed by his model because of this uh, predictive capability that was stressed in many of his articles and was also confirmed by some experimental evidence. So coming to the uh, discussion which was started this morning about uh, um, the verification, the predictability of the cold diffusion model and the, also the falsifiability eh, of this model, I think that uh, in this field there are very few uh, possibilities uh, of models that can work in this way. Eh? Certainly the electron screening is one, certainly one of, of those models, but there are other models. I think uh, Wisowski models is uh, just in this category, and I'll try to convince you about that. So, let me just uh, summarize uh, some uh, theoretical aspects. I mean, the, the theory is not simple. I just put uh, some element here. We know, you, everybody knows Heisenberg uncertainty relations, but uh, Schrödinger uh, in, uh, in the 30s, uh, just a few years after the famous paper of Heisenberg, uh, observed that uh, the, this relationship is a particular case of the more general relationship in which considers the fact that the two uh, quantum uh, variables being statistical variables might be correlated. And this correlation can be expressed by uh, a correlation or covariance coefficient r uh, as the effect of changing the uh, uncertainty relationship in this term. We have an anti-commutator, you see, of the position and, um, and momentum variables here. And that, in case this term R becomes very close to one, to maximum correlation, this second member becomes infinite. So the uncertainty becomes very, very large. The question was at that time, at Schrodinger's time, was how the, this, uh, the states which present this uh, um, uh, correlation would look like. It took almost uh, 50 years uh, because before uh, some uh, uh, Russian theoretician uh, made uh, an analytical formulation of these uh, states, uh, which are the minimum uncertainty states, but with the correlation, and they include also um, free parameters that might increase this term very, uh, very much. Eh? So this uh, CCS, coherent correlated states, which are uh, the, mm, the, the effect that can be evident also if, they, uh, if particles in the same paper, the rational, if the particles are in this quantum correlated states, their possibility that the transmissivity through the Coulomb barrier may increase enormously by a factor of that, so by 100 orders of magnitude in case of R goes to one. But how those states are produced well, uh, this is the idea of Wysowski, of using a, um, an approach similar to what is known as a parametric resonator, because it can be shown that uh, the, this problem may, might be reduced to a resolution of the Ilse equation. Ilse equation is uh, uh, harmonic oscillators with variable frequency, but periodically variable frequency. Eh? And in this way, so, in this way, you can uh, express all this uh, correlation coefficient, all the relevant parameters, for instance, the squeezing parameters here. The squeezing means that uh, the uncertainty in the two um, variables, P and Q, is different in phase space. And the squeezing uh, states have been observed in light uh, using uh, nonlinear uh, crystals. So, it's, it's a very um, well-known uh, fact in physics. 
then you can you get an expression for the sigma, sigma on position, sigma on momentum this way. So in, in, all in all, the total energy of the system and the fluctuation of a particle in the, in the, in the, on the momentum, around the momentum, but also on the energy may increase enormously. And this, as we know, may uh, make the, the transmission to the Coulomb barrier much easier. So, uh, you see, how to, how to in, practice, in practice, how to do that? You need, we, you, we need here a sort of a, a harmonic oscillator with variable periodical frequency, like that, you see. A possibility is just to use a crystal lattice. In a crystal lattice, you know, a proton traveling toward feels a transverse potential, which can be uh, expressed in, uh, as harmonic uh, potential, although, you know, this is an is, is, is um, electrostatic potential, but we know from channeling theory that uh, the harmonic uh, approximation is quite valid, although this phenomenon has nothing to do with channeling, you have to precise. Then you introduce a longitudinal modulation of this potential just by traversing different uh, elements or layers of this lattice structure. In a sort of, uh, uh, say, snake-made uh, uh, trajectory like that, <laughs> something like that. So this is a sort of uh, situation like that. But this possibility can occur also in different situations in which you have a, a, travel, a, a proton traveling through a molecular cluster or a mo diatomic molecule because we can express a particle as a Fourier spectrum. So the situation of resonance can be obtained all in this case, but also in cases like that, it can, it can be easily shown. In practically, this, uh, this uh, uh, parametric resonance is like a swing, you know? You remember that uh, in, uh, in our childhood, when we want to increase the oscillation of the swing without being pushed by uh, companions, the idea was to uh, alternatively standing and sitting, standing and sitting. But uh, the frequency where we do that, that was, we, we could not uh, uh, remark, was uh, had to be exactly twice the frequency of the uh, oscillation system. Changing the center of mass made this effect. <clears throat> so what do we have done in practice? Uh, the reaction under study here is just a, a proton impinging of a on a lithium target, you know, lithium is mainly 95% lithium-7. And uh, uh, the test was made uh, at the Rosendorf laboratory in Dresden, very well known. We had the lithium, a, a lithium polycrystalline foil. Eh? Uh, we used the uh, um, proton beam from uh, a tetra source, ion source. We had the silicon detector. Uh, sample order, sample manipulators, all the, uh, quite uh, standard equipment. And uh, we know the peak energy in general is dictated by the plasma energy, but uh, uh, there is a grid assembly at the, at the exit of the ion source, which give the, gives us the possibility to adjust just the voltage in steps of one volt. So the model, the Vizoski models, uh, predicts uh, that the maximum correlation coefficient are of Z, where Z is the coordinate of the proton penetrating the crystal lattice, should be maximum at uh, a speed of two alpha times uh, the, the frequency of the um, transverse os oscillation of a particle in the, in the um, lattice. This, was, this would lead to fast increase of the uh, correlation coefficient even after the fourth lattice period, when the energy is uh, about 450 electron volts, so very low energy. So what we did is a systematic scanning 
uh, in this uh, grid voltage in those range which uh, we uh, could expect uh, the, the observance of some uh, reaction with production of helium particle. Ah. So this is a picture of the apparatus, another picture, uh, quite standard. You should uh, consider that uh, I, I did this uh, test alone only with the help of a, a technician from the German laboratory. This is, by the way, this man here is the head of the, of the ion source laboratory in Rosendorf. And I had only uh, two weeks to do that. So I could not check all various aspects, for instance, um, to measure accurately calibration uh, and um, to get uh, rid of the noise, etc., etc. There was no time enough. We had an harbinger of that. This is an, a result of a very um, interesting uh, experiment which was done during a long uh, period of test made in several laboratories of the United States by an independent group, Lipins oh, sorry, Lip uh, Lipinski and ah, qui. Lipinski, and uh, they, during one run, they, they had an apparatus very, very similar to other, eh? with the ion source, uh, detectors, etc. During one of those runs, they observe a peak in the production of uh, helium-4 exactly at the energy of half uh, 8.3 MeV, so the energy we expect. And they had a counting rate very, very high of the order for a short time, for a short interval time, they measured the counting rate of the 100 to 150 uh, particles per second. But they use also li lithium vapor, not only lithium solid target. And they observed, or oh, even in the, in the lithium vapor, they have a, a very large counting of the order of 10,000, up to 40,000 counts per second. I mean, this is a, a, a um, if confirmed, there would be extraordinary results. The problem that uh, they tried to uh, apply for a, a patent, which uh, was uh, rejected because their theory behind this phenomenon was completely crazy. They imagine some sort of uh, uh, gravitational change, change of the, the mass energy ratio. It's a very complicated thing that was also published, but has found no evidence anywhere else. So it's, of course, in general, when you apply for a patent, you should have also a valid background theory, not only the, some experimental evidence. Huh? And this is, uh, I think, uh, can um, be a sort of comment of what we have said uh, this, this, more, uh, this morning about uh, the, the need for a valid uh, theoretical model. Um, this is a noise, an analysis of noise profile due to the, um, to the uh, ion source, maybe electronic noise. But you see here, for instance, uh, this is the, the, the run 38 in which we have observed some helium-4. And you see here the noise was very, very low. Huh? Well, let's go ahead. This is uh, an example of the dependence um, of the, the factor G, which is uh, this value here, on the frequency, yes, on the energy, in the sense uh, this is the ratio between the velocity of the particle and, this, and the, the path which the particles are as inside the, 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 the lattice. You see there is a peak at twice uh, the, uh, the, the frequency of the uh, longitudinal lattice. And this is exactly what the parametric resonator uh, model predicts. And this is an example of a one minus R, and you see here after Z or most of, or the fourth lattice, uh, this R is very, very close to one. So this effect, uh, this uh, uh, onset of uh, coherent correlated state occurs very rapidly. Not, they don't need a, a long penetration into the bulk. 
So this is what we have measured during this run. Unfortunately, it was only in one case we had a very, very tiny signal at an energy that can be reconducted at the value of 8.3 MeV, what is alpha particle energy. Well, uh, this is uh, just uh, some comments. Why this experiment is difficult to reproduce? Because we had uh, a polycrystalline target, eh? a target uh, in which you have uh, many crystals, but the orientation of crystals is not known, can be random, completely random. So for the onset of CCS, we need exactly orthogonal onset. And maybe if we had the possibility to use a pure monocrystalline target, which is difficult to handle, very, very expensive, we uh, could uh, perhaps uh, characterize better the phenomenon. <laughs> so uh, the, the problem is that when, when you, uh, the, the, the grain geometry and the orientation may be uh, examined with electron backscattering diffraction method, inside diffraction goniometry, so it's a complicated analysis if you want really to use this system. It maybe can work, but maybe can uh, require a long, a long uh, analysis and a long test before. But what the American people observed was also the formation of this state in lithium vapor target. And I think in the future test, we should also consider the possibility of using lithium vapor from introducing some sort of furnace in the apparatus itself. So what are the, essentially the conclusion? The requirement of precise energy definition of primary proton beam. We need an ion irradiation facility with accurate energy definition, high current and beam spot sites control, down to energy of the order of 100 electron volts. <sighs> May keep the, with the electron synchrotron, uh, cyclotron resonance ion source, beam line with ion optical elements and Faraday caps beam transformation, all uh, say standard e equipment. We need ion species separation, precise momentum measurement. These all elements are clearly uh, um, absolutely necessary if you want to characterize the phenomena. And the reproducibility, this strictly depends on the quality of the target. Experimental setup must be able to host both solid and gasly target, according to previous results. And our theoretical model, high, high rate proton lithium reaction with copious alpha particle production were observed at the insection of a proton beam with a vertical lithium vapor, etc., etc. But uh, there is another possibility that the use of a thin crystalline film, for example, graphene film, to form a CCS and combine it with a normal polycrystalline lithium target located at a few nanometers distance, huh? more or less something that can be depicted in this way, more or less. The important thing is that the onset of this CCS is something is a single particle effect. So the, when the particles goes into such a state, it stays there. And then after it can, in, it can in, um, interact nuclearly with the lithium uh, atoms, whatever, whatever atoms have, or wherever they are. And there are, there are other, other configuration also possible uh, in, in this way. If confirmed, this results, if confirmed, give rise to a real possibility based on scientific assessment principle, constructing a simple, cheap, efficient, and clean energy source based on radiation-free nuclear reaction in hydrogen lithium plasma at very low energy. The, the, the important thing is that this model could be extended even at uh, ambient uh, temperature for most people here who have uh, their own experiment uh, at uh, low or very low temperature in their laboratory. The problem is that to work on it, but 
I mean, uh, I, I think it should, it should uh, uh, one, once uh, this model has been assessed, we can uh, perhaps uh, find a way also to transfer this uh, approach even to low temperature experiment. I mean, it's my hope. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for completing your, your presentation. On time, well done. Well, it's we, time for questions. We, we delayed, but. Yes, thank you very much for your presentation, Sergio. I have a question, I'm not sure to understand. You, in a lithium solid target, you know where these atoms are in the lattice, and I have no difficulty to imagine, uh, you know, step by step uh, kind of correlation. In a lithium vapor, the atoms are, the distance between uh, adjacent atoms is everything, uh, anything. So how can you get uh, a well, in a lithium, well, you can imagine that the proton cross, uh, you have a diatomic molecule, a lithium can pass through. I mean, the a proton can pass through. So uh, the point is that the proton is, is, is seen by, by the molecule as a wave packet with several Fourier components. And one of those components, will, in, in principle, should resonate with the transverse uh, field that the molecules offer. Uh, you know, it, it's OK. Uh, I mean, uh, I mean Making such experiment with the vapor, I think it's worth because uh, the problem with the, with the solid the targets uh, are those uh, that I said before, this, uh, this, the, 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 the lithium uh, uh, solid pure crystals has to be oriented because the manufacturer does it, that gives you something that the orientation is not known. So you have to, uh, to make uh, some uh, X-ray diffraction geniometries or all those techniques of that's, I mean, and, and uh, you know, uh, if the, the lithium uh, oxidizes very, very mm. quickly and this can be a problem. But there are the other possibility to use, uh, I mean, uh, thin uh, crystals just to, to build up those state and then you use a polycrystalline lithium afterwards yeah in this way and the energy of the proton beam is 450 electron volts so uh, I had the same uh, uh, question as uh, Jacques uh, so, so I still don't understand very well the, the case of the lithium vapor. And uh, I could add that, uh, I mean, uh, even if you consider the molecules, uh, the molecules are randomly oriented in the vapor. So you, you don't have a real, uh, you have the same uh, situation as the polycrystalline target eventually. This is the first point. Then from a technical point of view, the molecules are, uh, let's say, a, a very low percentage of the vapor. Uh, so you mean uh, you, you need a very high density of lithium, and this means a very high temperature, uh, as uh, lithium has a very, very low uh, vapor pressure. Uh, so so you, you, you need uh, something like uh, several uh, uh, hundred centigrade in order to obtain a, a, good, uh, a good density? Well, I don't have now the value or the measurement by, by the American group, uh, and this, uh, this uh, case here. Um, eh? What? No, but this, this pressure, which one? Ah, yeah. that's why, yeah, this is the pressure, see. Mm. So probably it's, you, you think it's a, it's a, it's a, med, it's a matter of a chance. <laughs>
just crossing the molecule with such a pressure. Um, okay, um, so thanks for the energy. Uh, can I ask, uh, great presentation by the way, Sergio. Um, how is the proton beam made and what is the flux rate? The flux rate, uh, uh, the current here was uh, the order of microamps. But the uh, measurement of the, uh, we, we could not measure the, the current in such experiment. Problem. Okay, put that to one side. How is the uh, proton beam made? The proton beam made is by is a electron cyclotron resonance method. You, so, cre you create a plasma, you know? Ah. Okay, so um, given, would you say that all of the protons entering the chamber are monochromatic? They're all exactly the same No, energy? they're not monochromatic. Uh, would there be a distribution curve? Sorry? <laughs> would there be a reasonable distribution curve? Uh, the distribution... I, I don't know. You, you know, the plasma has intrinsic energy, but they... I mean, this, um, I cannot show you now the, the, the picture, but I mean, this uh, ion source has been built uh, with um, quite good analysis of all data. They, can, they, they have a, a good resolution, also energy resolution. I can show you perhaps the paper because it was designed by people of the University of Hamburg and then transferred to the firm, to the Tektra firm for realization. So, I mean, I do not expect you have a monochromatic beam. For this, you did a magnetic analyzing system, and then, <laughs> I mean, this is something more and more complicated. Okay, so um, could I ask you to consider that there might be something produced in the plasma, in the, in the synchrotron, that is produced in the process of making the proton beam that is carried along with it, which is able to uh, cohere and focus the lithium gas ions. And if, if you can assume that, I'd like you to do an experiment if you get the opportunity, which is to have some x-ray film above and below a very strong magnet and fire this beam through and see what you get on the x-ray films. Ah. Okay, I'll explain later, but... Yeah, we can discuss perhaps okay. better Because later. I don't think it's the proton interaction, I think it's something that's made in the synchrotron that goes through into the chamber and that coheres the lithium gas. It's not necessary to have a single crystal. Uh-huh. Okay. Very interesting, thank you. Other questions? If there are no more questions... If there are no more questions, let's pass on to Alan Smith who has got quite a lot of talking to do, I understand. Yeah, but it's not on this computer. All right, I just resent it to Claudio just in case about ten minutes ago. Oh, well, so, so, where is Claudio? Do we have a Claudio? No. Is Claudio here? He's, he's in the foyer. Ah. Go and grab him. I'll go grab him. This presentation, uh, the first one, Come to the me. Okay. I don't really need it. This presentation uh, <laughs> should be um, by Frank Gordon with his own voiceover. I think that's close enough. Stop it. 
<laughs> and uh, he, he, as you know, Frank and Harper Whitehouse, uh, over the last seven years have been gradually, slowly developing what they call the lattice energy converter. And the lattice energy converter is, uh, can you hear me okay? God, right. The lattice energy converter. Better? This way? You like that better? Okay. The lattice energy converter is um, a very simple system. It's a two electrode cell, and the only connection between electrodes is the gas space. And uh, I've been working on this, and Jean-Paul Biberian has also replicated it. And uh, as, as well as that, Antonio Di Stefano, Alan Goldwater in America has done some work on it. And uh, I think Jacques Rouer as well, possibly. I don't know if it started yet. Yes? Is that a yes? Yeah. So we know it works. What we don't know is why it works, or indeed how it works. And uh, there, are, there are theories. Um, Ed Storms, for example, thinks that the hydrided metal electrode is, is releasing electrons directly. I'm not sure I buy that because we haven't been able to see any. Um, the only evidence for that kind of particle emission is uh, a very old paper now, 20 years ago, uh, Root and Chico Srinivasan, who showed a very similar experiment in which the electrode the hydrided electrode would fog X-ray film, and uh, that was a that was a breakthrough for, for for them, and also a breakthrough for Frank Gordon. the The effect is so obvious and so ubiquitous. You see it in many different materials, and in my presentation is going to be about the range of materials in which I've seen the LEC effect, and very easy to, uh, to create. These, these are $10 experiments. They're, 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 you, do, you really don't need any fancy equipment. And I say there is an abiding mystery. It, Ed thinks it's electrons. I suspect it's possibly the energy from naked protons, but people who know more about nuclear physics than me say that's not possible. So uh, it's still a mystery. Um, do you have anything, any thoughts on that, Jean-Paul? Yeah. yeah, I have one of the cells here, so I'm reading at the bed. Okay, perfect, yeah. Yeah, so you can actually see it. Now, in terms of energy production, uh, these cells reliably produce anything between 100 and, say, 700 or 800 millivolts, but it's at the nanowatt level or the nanoampere, sorry, micro, a few microwatts. So the energy production level isn't high, but why is it there at all? I'll give you an example of the phenomena, because people have said, well, it's, perhaps it's an oxidation reaction on the, on the hydrated surface, and there have been many, it's galvanism and so on, and gradually, I think we've, and in my presentation, I'll show you how I've, I've disproved some of those ideas uh, by, using, for example, two electrodes made from the same metal. So there's a tiny work function difference between them because one is hydrided and one is not, but it's very small. And uh, you still see the voltage, you still see the generated current. Uh, another way uh, that I looked for chemical activity was to connect a working elect electrode to a very good instrument grade earth, a big copper plate buried in, a wet, in, in wet ground and if you put a multimeter between them, you get zero volts. If you take the passive electrode, yeah, the counter electrode as Frank calls it, then, and you, uh, that's it, lovely. If you take the, uh, the counter electrode and you do the same thing, you get zero volts. Put the two electrodes together with an insulating spacer and you measure a voltage between them. So it's obviously ionization of the gas somehow, but it's the somehow that's the mystery. Can you start it off? Thank you. Um, Alan Goldwater has had, had a look under vacuum, and uh, in his presentation later, you'll see more about that. Oh, so, oh, this is my one. This is my presentation, okay. Is it, 
The down key? Okay. Perfect. And then Okay, great. Fine. Right. So to begin. There's, this is a this is a very brief description. These these slides, by the way, are not heavy on words because I find I can't read a lot of the PowerPoint presentations people put up. Uh, it's probably my age, but nevertheless, too much small print is a killer. So this is uh, pretty much Frank Frank and Harper's uh, description that it spontaneously produces ionising radiation. Personally, uh, the jury's out on that one as far as I'm concerned, but it does produce electrical energy based on the thermal energy, energy in, in, the, in the lattice. So, and it's sustained. Um, I'll cut to the chase on, on the sustained part. Frank and Harper have got a tubular sealed lek, uh, which was full of hydrogen seven years ago, probably still isn't, and it contains a work, a, a, a rod-like working electrode in the centre, and it's encased in a tube. A plumbing fitting, in actual fact. They're, they've, they've been very good on using plumbing parts for this. And after seven years, it does not produce a spontaneous voltage, but it still conducts electricity through the gas space in both directions. So it's not a diode of any kind. And how, how the hell uh, the the counter electrode which is which is in theory untreated can actually do that is a bit of a mystery to me but some of you may have an idea on that right. here we go this is uh, the kind of design that uh, uh, Frank and Antonio Di Stefano in particular have been using I think John Paul has been using similar similar though on a different scale electrodes uh, in, in the inside there, you see the working electrode in the dismantled uh, one at the top and uh, the counter electrode, which as you can see is a plumbing fitting. So that's the basic geometry that they were using. I've been doing my work with flat plate electrodes in air, yeah, because there is no necessity to use hydrogen, but we'll get to that in a moment. And uh, here you see uh, some comments about the form factor. Yeah, so top left are the kind of brass plates that I was using. I started out doing co-deposition, as Frank said was necessary, thought was necessary, uh, of iron, uh, co-deposition co of iron and hydrogen. In, in other words, simultaneously creating hydrogen at the cathode surface and plating iron onto it. Because as has been known for several hundred years, iron absorbs a lot of hydrogen. In fact, it may in some, some ways be better than palladium. Um, not such a nice material to work for. One of the problems is that the electrodes tend to corrode very quickly in air, particularly if you, and mostly if you use, say, hydrogen, hydrochloric acid as an electrolyte um, and with an iron anode. And uh, I discovered that using alkaline electrolytes uh, tended to, even if I had to lace them with ammonia, for example, that tends to passivate the surface, the plated surface, so you get less, less corrosion that way. Right, and uh, talking about this is another kind of uh, lek. So I realized that the lek was a very rugged system, a very pervasive phenomenon, which is easy to create, in fact, I found it very often more difficult not to create it. But <laughs> so this is very unusual for a, a cold fusion phenomenon, if indeed it is. I think it is, but I'm not sure how. So I used flat plates and I did some work on, uh, not very successfully actually, on trying to hydrogen load powders in, in, a, in a cup cathode at the bottom of a beaker. That's on the right hand side of the image you can see on there. Um, that didn't work so well, I, I need to revisit that. And if anybody's got good ideas on the hydriding of powders, wet, I would like to, I know how to do it dry, I can gas load it, but, uh, and I may get round to that, but not yet. So, 
This is a student experiment because it breaks all the rules that we've come to take for granted. Does the working electrode need to be palladium or iron? No. Do you need any other exotic materials or gases? No. Is co-deposition required? No. Do you need a dangerous electrolyte? No, I use potassium carbonate for all of the series of experiments I'm going to report today because of its relatively benign nature. Um, I got fed up with electrolysis experiments years ago where you find the anodes vanished. Where did that go? Or the cathode, one or the other. Yeah, so I, I use something, one molar potassium carbonate. Uh, you could drink it if you were crazy enough, um, but preferably before you do the experiment. Um, <laughs> Do you need uh, materials for the working electrode and the counter electrode of different work functions? Not really. Do you need heavy water? Not really. Um, has anybody detected radioactivity? No. Uh, is a positive result easy and cheap to detect? I would say yes. And could students do it? I would also say yes. So if there's anybody here who, who has an appropriate kind of student rabble that they could get to do this experiment, it would be a very good idea, I think. Frank is very keen on people replicating uh, this work pretty much any way they can. This is, um, this is the marmalade jar experiment. Here, uh, I was using uh, nickel foam, battery electrode material, which is inexpensive. And uh, the, the, the marmalade jar on the left, I ate the marmalade, by the way, it was very good. Um, <laughs> the marmalade jar on the left is lined throughout uh, with nickel foam, which is very easy to solder onto, by the way. It's, you know, it's no problem making connections or anything. And inside the uh, nickel foam, there's another cylinder, which is fly screen mesh, nylon fly screen mesh, uh, of the kind that they put over windows in America and places, other places where they have mosquitoes. And the center electrode is a piece of hydrided nickel foam. So there's the same material. There is effectively no different work function. And uh, I can't read the figures on there now, I can't remember. But it produced a reasonable voltage. And uh, it gradually declined. I think a week later it was still producing some voltage. But it was only in air and just discarded on the bench because I did, over a period of two weeks, I did something like 44 electrolysis experiments. I was for 48 hours a time. So I had all on the go every day four experiments, two to take off and measure and two to set up and, uh, and, and one that was kind of incubating for the 48 hour period. And uh, in terms of uh, how the hydriding was done, I wanted to standardize as much as I could. It's quite difficult because you're using different materials um, so all I could do, and also all my electrodes weren't the same size, not exactly the same size, because most of these plates came out of my odds and sods box, as it were, yeah, the, the, the bits and pieces that uh, were, were in the engineering part of my shop. So it's quite possible we could expand this, uh, this materials uh, space even bigger. But um, I think the... Uh, the key thing is here, this kind of, this and other experiments I've done, which we'll come to in a moment, get rid of the idea that there's any kind of unforeseen galvanic effect. Uh, so that galvanism's out the window. I think the experiment that I mentioned earlier, where you connect a, a working electrode via a multimeter uh, to earth, demonstrates that it's not necessarily any chemical activity on the surface. So those are two major objections to uh, to this being a real, a real effect, uh, both of which have been disposed of. Now, here we go. This is what worked and what didn't. Um, gosh, I'm in somewhat of a quandary here because I can't really read that on there, but I can read it on here. So I'm gonna turn around here. To, uh, hang on. So the, the anode materials in the left-hand column uh, the, the working electrode material, the cathode, is, is also over there on the left. The counter electrode, of course, is passive. It's just a piece of metal that you connect to the multimeter. Um, 
and there's a space between that and the working electrode. And I used, throughout this experiment, I used, uh, generally speaking, fly screen uh, or occasionally microscope slides. Um, the measurements were all derived using the same method, but I can't remember what it was. These are often the averages of two or three trials. Um, that's not because they didn't work, but because I wanted to be sure that the result I was looking at was reasonable. So, uh, for example, the idea of using a carbon rod as an anode uh, actually tends to do away with the idea that any co-deposition is necessary. It's not necessary. Um, and you notice up the top there, I hydrided a piece of aluminium. And uh, I also measured that. I don't, yeah, it is clear here, you see, the counter electrode was also aluminium. So using an aluminium hydrided working electrode and a passive aluminium counter electrode, you still got a voltage. And it wasn't terribly durable, but uh, nevertheless, 48 hours or so afterwards, it was, it was still producing some kind of voltage. Now, aluminium isn't famously easy to hydride. And uh, certainly, there's, there's, there's no plating there because of the carbon anode. And you see here, there's a whole variety of, of results, different materials. So we have, uh, for example, carbon carbon doesn't work. Uh, lead lead, likewise, you, you see no voltage. So obviously, that's, lead is not terribly good under these conditions of at producing uh, hydriding. Uh, at hydriding. Um, to come briefly back to the kind of conditions I was using, uh, generally speaking, uh, I, I tried to get at least one volt of over potential above the Faraday limit. So there was copious hydrogen production, but round about one watt. Of, uh, of power consumption. So uh, is, this is not high energy electrolysis, it's continuous, it's not pulsed, there's nothing fancy about it at all. Um, to go on, sorry, so we looked at aluminium, carbon, ferrocerium, nickel plate and nickel foam uh, and lead, stainless steel and then the powder experiments. The only one that I had good success with, generally speaking, was terbium chips. And terbium probably, I think, hydrides very readily, but it also produced quite a, quite a, a good result in terms of voltage, 460, and even 48 hours later, it was still producing 355 volts. So that, I consider that to be a, a, a good candidate material if it wasn't so expensive. But you don't need it, you don't need it. Stainless steel was a bit of a disappointment because of the high iron content. Uh, you can see it just produced 10 milliamps or something when it was fresh and, uh, and uh, just a few, 48, it's three, three millivolts, 48 hours later. All these electrodes, by the way, were oven dry, were, uh, the, the process was take it out of the tank, wash the electrolyte off the surface, mostly just under a tap, and uh, uh, so not even distilled water. The electrolyte was all made in distilled water, by the way, but I would wash the, elect the electrodes off under the tap and, uh, dry and pat them dry with a paper towel. They, these weren't particularly babied and put them in an oven at 60 centigrade for an hour. Yeah, and that was just to drive off any residual moisture. And that, seemed, that was generally speaking enough. Ferrocerium is there, you see now. Ferrocerium is a bit of an outlier material. I am wary about the results of the soft ferrocerium in particular. For those that don't know, ferrocerium is the stuff that they sell in survival shops for making campfires in the wilderness. It's, it's a bit like Zippo lighter flint material. It's roughly 40% cerium and a mix of other lanthanides because they're not particularly well segregated in, in it and it's mixed with iron oxide and magnesium oxide. So it's a kind of metal doped ceramic or, or ceramic doped metal, if you like. Um, and uh, to use it in, in practice, you, you strike it like a, a very reluctant match on a box, yeah? And it produces showers of sparks. And the soft kind produces a lot more sparks than the hard kind. I can only assume 
because that's got more cerium and less ceramic. It's very inexpensive. It's uh, like four or five dollars at the most uh, for, a, for a sample. There's two kinds, there's soft kind and the hard kind. The hard kind, I didn't get such good results with, but if you look here, uh, the, fourth the fourth row down, um, we got some remarkably high voltages from it and uh, also quite durable as well, yeah? Now, everybody knows cerium loves hydrogen, for sure, so that may be it, or because the cathode was somewhat eroded, I am a little concerned that there may be an anomaly there, that there may be some residual chemical effects. I've, I've got some more ferrocerium now. I can go back to it. Um, okay. This, um, this was um, mostly related to some work I did last year with, with Matt Lilly, um, where we found the smaller the spacing, the higher the output, obviously, because uh, the ions in the, in the gas don't have so far to travel. They retain more of their kinetic energy, perhaps. Um, it's not my field of specialism, so I don't know. A single sheet of saran food wrap was enough to stop the lek working altogether. So just that, you know, whatever they are, 50 microns thick or something, saran plastic will actually give you zero volts every time. Uh, so whatever's happening, it's not very penetrating. Um, okay, and oh, the table is the recovery time. This is something else interesting about the lek. You can get a working electrode and a, and a counter electrode and effectively short circuiting them by laying one plate directly onto another. And when you take the, when you separate them, you get a spontaneous voltage again, and you can leave them together for a week. I haven't done it for any longer, and you will still get a spontaneous voltage when you separate the two. It's this, this, these are some of the many, many puzzles about the neck that we need to chase down, but it's not a battery. It's not a battery of any kind. Ed Storms, uh, I was discussing it with, this with him at ICCF24, and dear Ed, bless him, has an opinion on everything. He thinks that this is not a practical battery of any kind, but he does think it's an amazingly sensitive device for actually checking out LENR. He, he thinks this is possibly the most sensitive detector anybody's ever built. Um, in terms of detection, by the way, uh, Antonio Di Stefano has recently reported on LENAR Forum that he's been able to detect, uh, and you can see this on an oscilloscope, by the way, that the, the voltage is sometimes bursty. And uh, he, can, he used a very sensitive audio amplifier and he could pick up clicks yeah, from, from a, a working electrode uh, when it was paired up with a counter electrode, showing these little spikes of voltage which were too fast and too transient for his scope to pick up. Yeah, but I have seen them, I have seen them. I think the, the speed and duration of these little transient spikes probably depends on the material combination that you've got. But in his case, he could pick them up on audio, but not on a scope. Okay. Um, there. Practicality? Well, Frank gave a presentation, Frank Gordon gave a presentation at ICCF 24, in which he described how to be really good, really useful, it, we need to increase the output by 14 orders of magnitude. So that depends on material science, better material science, which I've begun to, in my own small way to contribute to. Uh, we're talking about plate area or about stacked plates, uh, about looking at the gas mixture, because the gas mixture, uh, unlike John Paul, who found the opposite, I found that uh, the presence of acetone vapor, uh, as well as air, uh, increase the voltage available, and acetone does have a lower activation energy than air. Um, Frank has discovered that pure hydrogen produces a lower voltage than hydrogen with some air in it. Yeah, a hydrogen air mix is good. So there has been some speculation that possibly nitrogen plays a role, even though it has a fairly high activation energy. Much to learn, much to learn. Um, can it be scaled? Well, We'd all like to think it could be. We're going to have a go. And um, 
the answer for me is still maybe. It is not actually a real current source. It's a voltage source, yeah? The, 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 the amperes, as I say, are down there in the, the nanoamps, yeah? But this resilient behavior uh, suggests it's current, it's, it's a current source yeah? at the moment. We need to turn it into some kind, sorry, a voltage source. We need to turn it into a current source to make it really useful. And that's where the real work lies. I'll, there we are. Thanks. This is me. You, you, you're going to have some more lek in a moment if uh, Emanuele can come and can you start off the, the next presentation? This is a recorded presentation by Frank. We may not have his voiceover, um, but I'm not sure. Is this the one with the voiceover? Frank, can you do the Frank Gordon presentation? Can you cue it up? I emailed it to Claudio some time ago, and Frank emailed it to Claudio, and I've, I've, I emailed it again today. He's had three shots at it. Yeah. Sorry? To Claudio about half an hour ago, just in case something messed up. Mm. What do I know? What do I know? Okay. Yes, of course. Um, thank you very much, Alan, for a great talk. Um, uh, where are we? Um, okay, fine. Um, yeah, it's interesting that one of your first points about energy from naked uh, protons, obviously, there's the Langmuir atomic hydrogen anomaly, which uh, um, I think he was disabused of, uh, but I think it's a real phenomenon. Um, if you look, it's related to what I was saying to Sergio. When you do that electrolysis and the deposition, or just the electrolysis, the hydriding, mm -hmm. you will create bare protons in that process, and also cavitation to a degree. And this creates this thing that I was talking about with um, Sergio. Um, this leads to charge clusters, and when the, they they can live for long periods of time in metals, and then they get fed, they come out after a while. And uh, Shoulders and Shishkin uh, individually have shown that when these um, explode and release their coherent electrons, they produce 5 to 11, uh, 10 kiloelectron volts uh, in terms of um, uh, what looks like X-rays. And this would produce ionization, and it would also uh, produce, uh, account for the clicking, because this is precisely what happens. You get a blast, and we've observed that. Now, the, the, when the hydrogen reconstitutes, it recaptures from the cosmic flux what it lost, the structures that it makes, which I will discuss. Um, the, uh, when you, um, yeah, blah, blah, blah. I noticed in every single case used uh, potassium carbonate. Yes. And as you're probably aware, this is the primordial isotope with the shortest half-life. Uh, I am indeed aware. In terms of beta, not yes. uranium-235. And an exotic vacuum object, uh, a charged cluster, will potentially cause that decay if you read uh, Parker Mod's weak theory. And he says potassium-40 is the, the fuel of the future. And so it's interesting that there's one common denominator amongst every single example you've got there. So in summary, I would say absolutely this is Lena. 100%. I've never seen this data. It's the first time I've seen it. And uh, it is a demonstration of the data. And it's interesting you say it's a detector because if you had a flux of these coming from another reactor, the thing would produce the same effects as it produces itself. So okay. it's. Yeah, it, perhaps I can answer some yeah, of your thank questions, you. really. Otherwise, you can come up on the stage with me, Bob, and, <laughs> and we'll have a conversation. <laughs> the. Um, the, the best argument in favour of, of EVO release is, as you say, the clicks, yeah? The sudden, spontaneous uh, emission or, or collection of, uh, of electrical energy, yeah? And um, they're fast and they're frequent, yeah, in a, in a good electrode. So, yes, that, that, go, that absolutely suits the bill. Um, in terms of proton, yes, I'm uh, very much in favour of the idea that there are naked protons deposited within the, the bulk metal that uh, may come back to the surface and uh, 
But as I say, nuclear physics is not my field. Yeah. Uh, Oh, sure, yeah, okay, yeah. We'll talk about it afterwards, perhaps, yeah. Um, in terms of uh, ionising radiation, worth pointing out that Frank, early on, uh, tried to, uh, well, rather vulgar English expression, he tried to goose it by uh, putting americium smoke detector capsules underneath the uh, passive electrode and didn't have uh, a phenomenal result. He, he found that in order to match the output of a LEC uh, with untreated electrodes, just the americium uh, emissions, that he needed something like two curies of americium <laughs> uh, to uh, a rather <laughs> large amount. So when you, you know, when you can do it as simply as these experiments show, and they really are simple, I think from the 44 that I did, uh, around about over 30 of them worked. Uh, I didn't include the results of all 30 because yeah, I, they're, they're things I want to revisit, but it just goes to show this, this is a proper student experiment. And uh, in terms of replicating and spreading the word about Lenar, it's possibly an ideal stalking horse. Yeah. Sorry, did you have a well, question? Thank, thank so, you very um, much. Oh, as no. I, I informed uh, at the conference in the uh, United States, 24, uh, we sometimes observed such kind of phenomena but in our specific environment, distance about two millimeters, mm -hmm. the uh, active electrode, the effective surface area is about one meter, one square meter. Mm -hmm. The counter electrode is iron. And uh, this effect don't happen uh, at the beginning, only after uh, one week of a source of hydrogen. Yes. And the voltage typically, but it's not, not regular, from about 100 millivolts up to 500, 600 millivolts, but it's not regular. And the typical current is the weak point, only few microamperes. So this, is, this was a bursty phenomenon. You say not regular, you mean it's... Yeah, yeah. it's not regular. I watch with the oscilloscope uh -huh. and very, very noisy. So anyway, but... Uh, but uh, the amount mm. is uh, microwatt. Yes. Microwatt yes. for square meter. So, <laughs> <laughs> no practical. <laughs> well, we, Frank has achieved, and, and, and I have achieved, microwatts um, from just like 20 square centimeters or so. Oh. Yeah. So, so, we beat you there. Anyway, but, uh, but this is wet loaded, and you're talking about gas loading. Okay. Yeah. Anyway, we want to make more systematic study because of easy course. to do. Of course, yes. Okay. Yeah. Yes, this is my point. You know, as I saw my name on your presentation, uh, how to make sure, definitely sure, and uh, this is a question you have a part of the answer already, that this experiment, this is fascinating, is related to LENR. You know, well, it's very uh, okay. Another point, uh, you mentioned the role of potassium. I made the experiment with uh, iron chloride and you get, the, you get the effect, no? You don't need uh, potassium. Mm -hmm. But how, why, why, why are we talking about LENR in this case? We would like to have a very clear uh, demonstration, you know? I agree. It's still a mystery, Jacques. Jacques. Uh, we don't know. I mean, Frank is very much of the opinion that this is LENR. Ed Storms is also of the opinion that it's LENR. And I believe since I see CCF24, he's been going back and he's been measuring voltage from the materials that he uses in his, in his experiments. Yeah. And uh, he's quite excited about it, bless. Uh, it's nice to know he can still get excited at 93, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. And so Ed, Ed is of the opinion. Um, Better men than me think it's LENR. I don't know, but I'm very happy to do the work. Alan, can I qualify my point? I'm not saying it is LENR. I'm saying it shows the principle behind LENR. Indeed. And therefore, it's part of the same family. Yeah, sure. It's, uh, yeah. it's a target experiment, if you like. Is this LENR? That's a, it's, a, it's a very good case. I think we want to move on now, if we can. Is, right. Is this one the cover? This is my paper. No, no.
Wait, but there's nothing incorrect about it, I assure you, but Frank Gordon's presentation. Okay. Yeah. You don't know which one it is? Claudio has got it three times by email, yes, and Bill twice. Go find it. <laughs> <laughs> Meanwhile, I've, um, there's no piano here, so if there was, I would take requests. But <laughs> hang on, hang on. Let me get back to the mic. He's in a separate email. Sorry. Yeah, this is a I, I emailed separate. it to Claudio Park. Okay. Yeah, he's got it. Whichever one you find first. <coughs> I'm sorry about this. It appears to be a slight technical hitch. Yeah, never mind. I thought this would happen. So I brought my violin. Peter, you had a question? Uh, I sent that one to. I sent that one to, yeah. 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 That, wa that was last in the running order, yes. Uh. Uh, ah, question. Uh, can, I give a, can I talk a few minutes? Yeah. You can talk, yes. You're going to come and talk or? No, from here. Okay, fine. fine. Um, I have measured up to 80 microwatts of power when loaded in on a one kilo ohm resistor or 10 kilo ohm, uh -huh. I don't remember the numbers. Um, that's one thing. Uh, second is that I think what we are doing, we are doing X-rays emission, and these X-rays are ionizing the gas that's inside the cell. That's why it works. So the, the thing is to measure the X-rays, which is quite easy to do, you know, because X-rays are easy to measure. So that's my next step. So for the next meeting, I will have the answer to your question, is it, uh, is it LENR or not? <laughs> Alan, Alan, sorry, uh, Jean-Paul, Alan Goldwater, I'll just mention his presentation comes later when they find it. Um, he used a Bruca uh, detector, yeah. and, uh, but he discovered that he could actually use the EDS on his electron microscope you know, with a beam off and in a vacuum. And he, he's pretty confident that he checked for emissions down to 10, uh, lower, I think, lower. Yeah, very low anyway, very low. Possibly even 10 EV, he saw nothing, yeah. But it may be that the technique isn't perfect, yeah. You should email him about it. You should discuss it with him. Any more questions? So I, I used, um, I'll just mention to Bob in particular, I used potassium carbonate because it's very benign in terms of electrolysis, yeah. Um, it's not an aggressive material at all. And uh, I, I've got fed up with doing electrolysis electrolysis experiments where you leave them running overnight and you come day, come the next day and the electrolysis, the cathode is slush on the bottom of the... <laughs> yes, yeah, the K40. Yeah. Yeah, sure, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm with the philosophy of that idea, as it were. Yeah, yeah. maybe that's what's happening. Yes, John paul Did I, have I stacked them up? Not yet, no, not yet. There hasn't been, uh, all of this research was done between coming back from ICCF 24, where I got Frank's blessing to do it, and coming here. So, yeah, it was, it's, <laughs> yeah, sure, yes, yeah. Stack plates is, is an obvious way to go, yeah. yeah. Good Lord, there's no service here. Ah, is the man. You got it? So please. <laughs> uh, when it is uh, before, when there is a, um, before your turn, when there is a break or so on, please uh, uh, download your presentation in PowerPoint format, if possible, or PDF, but PowerPoint is better. Uh, on our USB pen, we will, will uh, upload on the PC. In theory. I 
Well, it's Alex. You have to go back and retrieve that one too. Mm. Is that the PowerPoint? Is this from Kenny Rogers? Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. No one. Yeah. One. This. This possibly has a voiceover, but if it doesn't, we can talk about it. I'll stay here. Ah, this is not what it is. Okay. Do you remember? It, there is a voice. He sent a presentation with audio. Yes. Uh, can you speak louder? I, I I would attempt to uh, interpret Frank's. Uh, the text is comprehensive. What, what would you prefer to do? To wait for Frank Gordon's presentation with text audio and have a coffee now? Coffee now, come back when you have... Come back when you've got the trousers on. Okay, get, get Alan's on there so it's on, on the machine. You've got Alan's too, yeah? Yes. Oh, sweet. There's no voiceover with that, is there? No, he's no. expecting you to say yeah, something. Yeah, I... I